Shut up and sit down. Takeover Tuesday podcast. It's another Takeover Tuesday, and I have a very special guest uh, named Ben Robinson, who is a magician, our first magician on the show from New York City. Unfortunately, uh, my partner Carlos will not be joining us today. Uh, so it's just you and I. Ben, are you there? I am here. I, I have to admit to you, David, I, I made Carlos disappear, but don't <laughs> worry, he'll be back next week. <laughs> That's awesome. So Ben, you uh, you are a multifaceted, multi-talented magician. You're an author. Uh, you've done some really exciting things. You've performed uh, for people up uh, base camp of Mount Everest. Yes, sir. And uh, maybe start at the very beginning. You know how you got into show business and magic. All right. Well, it, it's a short and sweet story. In 1968, they were running a rerun from 1964 of the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show, which you know. People over 50 know who the Beatles were <laughs> and or are. And the Beatles yeah. aren't gone, right? And uh, it was a big problem for Ed Sullivan because who could follow the Beatles? Well, they picked a magician, and his name was Fred Capps. Now, magicians know Fred Capps immediately. The rest of the world today probably does not. He's the only man to have won what is called the Grand Prix three times. This is an award. That's a real award because it's only given if merited. Well, Caps followed the Beatles. I was seven years old and I watched him. My mother was sitting there and did. Oh, sorry. That was my parrot. Is that coming through, David, too terribly? No, that's fine. Okay, because he wants to be on the show, too. Um, and he <laughs> does magic opportunity. as well. <laughs> okay, yeah, he's a real ham. So I, I watched the, Fred Caps do his act and my mom said, Ben, how did he do that? And I said, I don't care, Mom. I just want to do that. That's me. Right. Now, that's a pretty heady thing for a seven-year-old to say. And my dad had died that year, so I didn't know him very well. He had been gone for a while. I don't want to get into the ugly family history. But, but that was basically it. You know, magic was a repose from kind of what was going on in my family, which wasn't so pleasant. And it was really my clue to, oh, this is joy. This is happiness. This is unfettered fun. And I got into it. And throughout my first seven years, I just read books. I, I may have seen a magician at a birthday party or something, but I didn't really take notice of it too much. And then when I was 14, I said, all right, I'm going to give this a whirl. I'm going to try to do a show. And I did. And I was paid a big $12. And I was terrible. You know, I wore a, cl this is a funny story. I, w I wore a clown face. So I oh, thought, nice. you know, more bang for the buck. You get your clowning, you get your magic. And uh, I was sweating because I didn't set the makeup properly. So as I'm doing my, my card magic, because all I did were card tricks, the makeup started to run down my face. So I looked like a sunset. <laughs> and at the end of it, you know, well, the end of it, I was supposed to do 20 minutes. And I think they canned me after about five or six. I just said, wait a minute. Uh, there's more here. I'm not, I'm not doing Fred Capps. This, there's something very missing here. And at the time, just four or five months earlier, a guy opened on Broadway in a show called The Magic Show. And his name was Doug Henning. And... Uh, I went to see the magic show, and then afterwards I went backstage and, uh, you know, hustled my way back there with a very demonstrative parent with me, a uh, relative guiding me. And I, I asked for an interview, which took a year to get, but I sat with Doug, and I'm now 15 years old, and I said, why are you great? You know, why, why do I suck? And why are you great? And he said, well, I won't teach you anything, but... I'll recommend some books for you to read, which I did. And uh, that was it. And by the time short, you know, I'll wrap this up. By the time I was 17, my mom, who was working, I was a single child of a single mother. So I didn't see her a lot. She wasn't around to police me. She said, you college. <clears throat> my grades weren't <clears throat> that great, but they were they were good enough. She said, but you'll have to apply for aid. And I said, well, what's aid? What's that? 
she said, well, we don't have enough money to send you to college, but you have to go. Now, that's kind of an odd thing to say to a kid. You have to do something, but we can't do it. <laughs> and I said, oh, you mean aid is money? And she said, yeah, a lot of aid. And I said, oh, I've got that covered. She said, what do you mean? And I went back to our back porch and I went underneath the porch and I had this, remember those lunch boxes that were made out of tin? They had oh, TV yeah. shows and stuff on them. Yeah. Well, anyway, I had $5,000 in that lunch box. Kids used to come over to our house because I was a single child. So no parent around, they'd come in and, you know, take stuff, but they wouldn't go under the porch. And that was all the money I had from doing magic shows. And so I paid for my first semester of college with that money in cash. And uh, then that gave me a six month start. Now, I, it, it took me three years to make that money. So I had to make that money every six months or something. So that was basically it. And I, I started doing coffee houses. I worked with, a, you know, all sorts of people, Neil Young, you know, real folkies, Pete Seeger. Then I, I got out of college and, and started. That was it. Okay, now uh, we've talked about this before, and uh, of course you're aware that I'm currently do uh, street magic on the street. Yes, sir, and I really admire you for it. It's hard, <laughs> hard work. It is a hard grind. Uh, you have some experience with this yourself. Yes. Uh, maybe uh, touch base on a little of that, because I don't think people, I mean, it's such a weird topic for most. Uh, it's a form of entrepreneurism, obviously, but people have no sort of, uh, can't relate to that at all, because, uh, well, public speaking, of course, is, a greater fear than uh, death and cancer and so forth. And it's also, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm starting an impromptu show where people aren't expecting and didn't leave their, their hotel or their, or their house to go see one. Right. So uh, maybe touch on your experiences uh, with doing this uh, most, uh, you know, unforgiving of uh, venues. Unforgiving, but most meritorious, because right. I think strategic street theater, I heard a phrase the other day, metamorphic street theater uh, <laughs> talk about highfalutin huh baby <laughs> well here's here's what happened and it, here well my basic experience was this and and we'll we'll jump right to the top of mount everest after i give you the the precursor which is this i was in college and this is the 70s so there wasn't really a lot of views comedy clubs hadn't busted out yet and so where does a guy do magic and when you do magic in the street of course no matter what you say or where you're doing it you are always watched from 360 degrees somebody will be behind you somebody will be looking down on you it's really you know you're playing to the world you're not just playing to the first couple of people in front of you and I knew this intrinsically so I started again traveling with my folk friends who play a guitar, put out a hat, or as we say, start the tip and, um, and gather a crowd. Now, singers can what? Hit three, four, five songs maybe, and then they need a break. Their voice needs liquid. And so, but they don't want to lose their crowd. So that was the perfect time for me to come in. I would come in, I would keep the crowd, do some magic, lay a surprise on them and and here was my big one which you know magicians just can't believe because it's it's really small it's really intellectual it's all the things that street magic shouldn't be right but it worked and it was dave vernon's i say day because i'm right. from the east coast it was <laughs> dave vernon's you know on the west coast all right die his name is die damn it it's die uh, dave vernon canadian folks yeah and uh, it was his trick called penetration of thought, which is basically this. I have four cards. You have four cards. They're the same cards. Dave, you're holding the package of cards in your hands. I don't go near them. I say, Dave, think of a card. You don't say it out loud. You don't touch it. Nothing. And all of a sudden, the card that you thought of goes from my hand into your hand. So now you're holding five cards. And my cards were red, your cards were blue. The one red card in your hand is the card you thought of. Right. Now, people who hear this say, how could you do that in the street? First of all, they can barely hear you without a microphone. Second <laughs> of all, cards are really small, so you expect them to see the suit and the domination from more than six feet away. 
Well, the reason it works so well and the reason I would make some money is because I was ostensibly proving to the audience that I was psychic and that really nailed them. So yes, I did a silk to cane, boom. For those who don't know, you change a silk scarf into a cane, put it down, next. Then I took another scarf and I pulled it through somebody's arm. You tie a knot, tie another knot, bango, it goes through their, their arm. Well, now I had them. That's, you know, silk to cane and a silk through an arm. That's maybe three minutes of material. But penetration of thought takes a little longer. That's about three minutes alone. So I had six good minutes and that's all you need. That's what I learned. Right. Because of what you said originally, they don't expect to see you. Right. And so a magician is a welcome surprise if they're good and a bad interruption if they're bad. And I find a lot of magicians try, or performers, let's just not lay it at the door of magicians. <clears throat> a lot of magicians, they try to talk a lot. They try to fight the crowd, the bus noises, the police sirens, all of it. You can't do it. You have to keep it small and work on perfection in a very small level. And when maybe 10, 12 people see something that you do small, then the hat will come. For all those you not hip to street lingo, the hat is what you and I do. We pass the hat, we, we make the money. That's where the money goes in the hat. It's, uh, and my friend David Aiken, the checkerboard guy, he says it's the most democratic form of street of theater because they pay what they want. Yeah, and they pay after they get it, too. Yeah, and I'm sure you've gotten big tips, and it made your day. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so so the relationship between the performer and the audience is so special. How many times do people go see a Broadway show, and the first you know, 20 minutes, they're scratching around going, eh, why am I here? Oh, I'm here because <laughs> I played $127 for this seat. So they figure they got to stay, even though they're not digging it. A street show... They can walk away if they want, but if they don't walk away, that's real talent. Harry Anderson once said to me, he said, Ben, I knew from the second I met you that you'd worked in the street. I said, oh yeah, why is that, Harry? He said, because you're listening to the audience and you're playing off of that. Guys who are on stage, they go out, they do their nine minutes, they leave. That's it. It's a factory job. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm simply saying it's an entirely different thing. So... Uh, Real quick resume, I worked at Faneuil Hall in Boston. I worked at the Seaport in New York. I worked at the uh, Shipyard, which is now a sea area, kind of a mall in Baltimore. Basically, during my college years from 78 to 82, I traveled from Bar Harbor, Maine to Baltimore, Maryland. That was my run. And I was leaving college on you know Friday afternoon at 2 o'clock and taking that $50, $75, something like that. And then once I had that as a base, I'd hit the street the next day, work it as hard as I could, probably be out there about 11 in the morning. People say, oh, that's really early to hit the street. Why'd you do that? Because I wanted to feel the area. I wanted to sniff it. I wanted to know where things are. And, you know, from one performer to another, in those days, you also got to watch out for the man. Right. And they weren't too happy <laughs> to, <laughs> you know see me or you sometimes now it's changed now you get a license and blah 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 but the real street gig that happened late 70s the beginning of the new vaudeville movement um was a really uh, edgy kind of world and i'm really proud to have done it because i tell my clients now you know i i got hired for uh, this plastics company last december apparently they're the second largest plastics company in the United States or something, whatever they are. Anyway, they, they said, well, can you meet, can you perform for our chairman of the board? You know, he, he's, he's a multi-billionaire and this and that. Well, if you've worked in the street, you yeah. can do anything. Yeah. I think it really is a launch pad for doing, I told that to somebody who uh, the other night who was not a street performer, but watched a bunch of our shows. There's a bunch of us down here in New Orleans currently. And, uh, she was like, she had the right personality for it. Like she was very outgoing and she was like, man, I, I'm just so intrigued by people doing this, you know, uh, making a living out of it. And, uh, I said, yeah, if you can go out there and start a, a show in the middle of the street where, like we said, no one's expecting it and, uh, and really draw people in and make some money doing it and stuff, you, you can literally do anything. Pretty much. And, and a, a gig where, you know, let's be frank, 
the street does not pay all that well sometimes. Sometimes right. it pays pretty well. But I don't think anyone who gets into street work does it for the money. Right. right. I, I really can't believe that. I think you have to be predisposed as a personality to wanting adventure in your life, wanting suspense, uh, wanting to learn to solve problems. How many times has the wind blown your stuff away? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and then what? And you're in the middle of a show. I mean, you can look goofy or you can become a great comedian. Yeah. George, Bur George Burns told me I was his opening act at the Friars Club once. And he, he brings me in. I was about 27, 28. He's sitting there in his long silken robe, smoking a cigar, age 89 or whatever he was. And, <laughs> and he said, so, kid, where have you worked? And I said, well, Mr. Burns, I started here, there, and the other. He said, well, you got to have a place to be bad. Right. And that's it. That's the street. Yep. You learn by meeting all of those challenges and succeeding ultimately. So, uh, you want to hear about Everest real quick? Yeah, let's jump to that because that, that's very okay. intriguing to people. Yeah, so... Uh, the end of the story first, I was hired by the American Everest team in 1989 to travel with them from a little airstrip at 9,700, uh, no, well, I'm going to get the the altitude wrong. I think it's 6,700 feet above sea level, which would seem pretty high, but that's where you begin because Everest starts at 17,800 feet. So you, I mean, it's, and then the tippy top of Everest is 29, 29, almost 30,000 feet, which is, you know, you're touching the brakes of airplanes as they fly by. Right. So, so I didn't, let's be clear. I did not go to the top of Mount Everest. Right. But I did go to the base camp. So that's roughly 18,000 feet. Well, that's a hell of a place to be. It's the other side of the moon. It's always shifting, the, meaning the ground underneath because it's solid ice and the sun comes out, it cracks, it creates an ocean, and then it freezes at 3.30. So there's no route. There's no map. It's, it, it's what do we have to deal with that day? And the higher you get, that's what it's like. Now, somebody might say, well, why did they want a magician along? I mean, what's that about? And the answer was this. The fellow who I went with was named Dick Bass. He just died last year. Uh, he was the oldest man to have climbed Everest to the top at age 55. And he had seen me perform at his roommate from college birthday party, a fellow named Ed Gaynor, in Southport, Connecticut, about two years prior. And it was just, you know, a private party gig. I knew Ed's daughter, still know her. And um, she said, would you be my present to my dad? And I said, sure, I'd love to. So we worked it out and I went up to Southport and I did the show. And that night I spent, I shared a room with Dick Bass. I didn't know who this guy was at all. All I knew is that he was a short, wiry, loudmouth Texan. And <laughs> this guy never shut up. And he left in the middle of the night, something like 4 a.m., to fly to Japan, as he said, to hustle the world's largest man out of a couple of hundred million dollars. Right. <laughs> and I thought, you know, if that's a line, that's a line, man. That, who says something like that? The next morning, I went down to breakfast and they said, hey, you shared a room with Dick Bass. He's some character, huh? And I said, you know, yeah, kind of like I'm not going to get into it because we're all guests here. But they said, here's his book. And it was called Seven Summits. And he didn't just climb Everest. He climbed the highest goddamn mountain on every continent of, of the world. Wow. With no prior experience. That's crazy. Yeah. And, and so what had happened is because Dick was a, a very loquacious guy and never, ever stopped when he had a goal. His great quote, which I give to you, Dave, to give to the world, if you don't stop you can't get stuck. There you go. And it's yeah, it's really beautiful because it, it's it's about setting goals and achieving them. And he saw my show. He owns this ski resort in Utah called Snowbird. He he practically built it. He, he didn't initiate it, but he created the world class ski resort that it is. 
And he said, oh, man, you got to come out to Snowbird. Oh, they'll love you, buddy. You know, that's how I talk. Just, <laughs> just over. It just wouldn't stop talking. So at breakfast that morning, I learned, oh, my goodness, this guy climbed Everest. This guy did this. And I was reading his book, which I encourage everyone to read, called Seven Summits. And I went home and I said, I owe this guy a phone call. He invited me to come out to his resort and from one performer to another. When somebody offers you a gig, man, yeah. you, chase, you chase it down. <laughs> you don't just let it be coffee talk. You know? right. So I did. And I, I ultimately convinced him. He said, oh, man, you know, I was just talking, but, you know, you really don't. And I said, listen, Dick, Dick, let me come out to Snowbird, earn way. I will do three weeks of magic. I will work in your restaurants. I will work on the promenade. You see what I do. And that's that. And I, uh, it worked, and I worked for him. That was the summer of 87. Then my agent put that in. I was playing colleges at that time, being an open, uh, hypnotist called R.L. Noran. So it was magic and hypnotism. and that's what they were selling. And they put out a brochure that said, you know, this is Ben Robinson. This is what he does. Here's R.L. Noran. Here's what he does. And I had it in my credits that, you know, I was a magician in residence for three weeks. That's a long gig for anybody. And uh, at Snowbird, so Flatter, I meet Dick again at Liza's wedding, and he says, how are things? And I said, jokingly, oh, here's how things are, and I hand him the brochure. And he looks at it, and he sees his name, and he sees his resort, and he says, how many of these are there? And I said, oh, my agent probably sends out a 1,000 a month. And he says, you're sending me a 1,000 customers a month? <laughs> and I say, no, no, Dick, I'm not. I'm trying to get hired here. Yeah. <laughs> and he says, listen, I'm going back to Everest. You worked for me at Snowbird. They will go for you there. And I also have a reason that I'll tell you once we're there. I think this is crazy. So we we worked out the money, which was significant because I hit him for a, a huge amount of cash because it was going to be six months of my life. I figure, you know, what's anybody's life worth for six months? Much less, he wanted me to work every night. Right. Now, Dave, <laughs> that's a ton of material because you're working for the same people. Right, right. And you have to maintain a certain quality. So you can't just start digging around for that yeah. toothpick trick you learned when you were five. <laughs> it has to be some, yeah. uh, some good stuff. Right. So... We, I flew from New York to Seattle, Seattle to Japan, the largest city in Japan is Tokyo, from Tokyo to Bangkok, from Bangkok to Kathmandu, and in Kathmandu, we boarded a small twin-engine plane, seated, I think, 12 people, flew up into the mountains at Lukla, and then you begin walking. Every night, we camped somewhere else. These are not, you know, Carlton hotels. These are... <laughs> <laughs> These are moldy tents with uh, that have been out there for years, and they've got every infested bacteria you can name, and probably a few that haven't been discovered yet uh, in them. And you're traveling with strangers, and what Dick wanted was he wanted me to entertain everybody, and then when we got to the base of Everest, for me to do a show for everybody, because there were maybe 80, 90 people there when we finally got there speaking many different languages. And as you well know, magic doesn't need any language to be understood. Something disappears, you don't have to say it in Chinese or English or Hungarian. And while they were watching my show, the American team hit the trail and went through the ice hall and went up. You'd say, okay, so what's the big deal? Well, the big deal was this, which he couldn't tell me in the United States. Every time the king of Nepal gave a writ, which means he signs his name, to a piece of paper allowing foreigners to go on a holy site, which is Everest, he got a quarter of a million dollars. Ah. That year, he signed his name 12 times. Ooh, daddy. Yeah. And that meant he sent 12 different bowling teams to the same alley. Right. So if you paid your quarter million, and I paid my quarter million, who goes first? Right. And the weather is a very shallow window. Right, right. 
So that was why Dick wanted me. He knew from seeing me at his friend's party and seeing three weeks of shows at Snowbird, he knew I could handle it and that I had enough material and that I was pleasant. I wouldn't get in anyone's face. And I also happened to have a degree in Asian studies. So that didn't hurt. And um, so I did the show and the American team left as they do in the middle of the night. So they because when the sun comes out, that's the dangerous part. Then then it's liquid. But when it's using and dawn or nighttime, you have something to grasp onto and they could get to camp three, camp four. And it was also a goodwill thing because he was looked upon as a rich Texan guy who had bought his way up Everest, which is anything but the truth. And the other thing was that he was highly criticized for wanting to clean up Everest. And he was saying, look, you got to get all those oxygen bottles out of there. I mean, there's there's something like 200 tons of waste up there. And he was one of the the very first thing to say, let's get it out of here. So it was kind of a goodwill mission. I'm sorry for the long no, no, it's story. Great. But, but uh, that's that's kind of why I was there. And then with the money I made, I took the rest of the year off and um, traveled in Vietnam and Tibet and uh, awesome. all over Nepal, uh, India. I was in, I was, because, you know, I figured this is it. This is my one shot to go there. How many times do you get paid to go to Asia? Right. And I have some really wonderful pictures. In fact, as you know, the cover of the book, The Importance of Wonder, is a picture of one of the final shows I gave. I taught the Sherpas how to make soap bubbles with glycerin. So the, the bubble on the cover is the size of a basketball, and it shows a little monk child staring up at this, because to us, bubbles here, there, you see them every day. Well, at 17,800 feet, they don't know bubbles. <laughs> right. <laughs> And all of a sudden, there's a bubble. It's floating, and right. then it disappears. Right. So this was truly wondrous. And one of the monks came to me and spoke through an interpreter and said, uh, the translation was, what are those otherworldly spheres? <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. And, and so... I, as much as it was a gig and I got paid and I did it and it was hard and I had some very hairy experiences, I, I slid down a, a glacier, uh, you know, I tripped and fell and had to be rescued. And, you know, it was really not not pleasant stuff. I mean, most of the time your head hurts. You've got you don't take a shower or anything for six, eight weeks. Sometimes, you know, you're a really grouty guy. And uh, but yet. I don't. I think I learned more about being a magician and being a performer in general from that trip than anything else that I've done. Right. Sounds like it was a real uh, teaching experience for sure. Mm-hmm. Well, that that does a nice segue into uh, your uh, authorship, your career as an author, sort of a side career you have going on. Uh, yeah. How did you get into writing books? Well. Uh, my mother was a professional writer. She uh, She's long gone. She died in 1990. But she was awarded the Best Young Fiction Prize by the Roosevelt Administration in 1945. So that means that the best 17-page story written in 1945, in the opinion of the Roosevelt Administration, was Ed Nelson. And so because my dad died when I was young and I was a single child, I grew up with my mother working on Madison Avenue and she would leave at seven o'clock in the morning and come home around eight o'clock at night and say, I have to sleep fast and get back to the office. Right. And I really didn't know what she did. And a couple of times I went to her office and I saw, Oh, she's a copywriter. What is that? <laughs> well, she had long legal pads. These are in the days before computers. Right. And, um, so she wrote the jingle of uh, Oreo cookies. A kid will eat the middle of Oreo first and save the chocolate cookie outside for last. <laughs> she, na <laughs> she named Mr. Bubble. In fact, if you go to YouTube and you see the little animated commercial from 1963 of Rupert the Scamp, where he puts all the bubbles on his face and he says, I'm not Rupert, I'm so on. And he pretends to be whoever he is. That was me. That's my voice sampled okay. in there. <laughs> and um, so I picked it up by osmosis. And the first book was called 12 Have Died. It came out in 1986. 
it's the history of the bullet catch. And uh, whenever I'm introduced, the, the joke is they say, and now, ladies and gentlemen, a man who has caught bullets in his teeth and lived to write about it. Of course, the title is 12 Have Died. <laughs> so, and gets a big laugh. <laughs> and it comes out. And I, Dave, I really didn't plan to write a book. The guy I was working with on the bullet cash, because I figured, well, you better research the hell out of this thing because you're going to get your head shot off. Because it, it's a really hard thing to convince an audience that what you're doing is real. That's the only way it can be sold. Otherwise, the solution is staring them right in the face. Oh, there's a blank in the gun. You've got one in your mouth. Big deal. <laughs> they've all right? Seen the, it, they've all seen the prestige too by now, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So it's so it's no, no illusion. There's no entertainment. But if you do it as Anneman did it, or Orville Meyer, who invented Anneman's method, where it's a real rifle, it's a live charge, it's marked. There's no fooling around here. You are really having a live rifle fired at your face. Then you're in a different territory. Now the performer is mad. Now he has a death wish. But when he catches the bullet and the policeman says, holy mackerel, this is my bullet. Now you're in the world of enormous mystery because death captures the imagination, right? Now, so Larry said, my, my partner, Larry White, said, Ben, you've got to write this up in a book. You've got to write this up in a book. I said, why, Larry, for the two people who care, you and me? <laughs> and he said, no, because if you get killed, we all want to know where you went wrong. <laughs> I said, well, thanks, Larry. Really appreciate it. Uh, so that became the book. I, I kind of wrote it up very quickly. I wrote up the history. I wrote up all my notes, gave it to Larry. I said, you go and sell it. You know, if you can do it, great. I, I, I'm going to do this. And that was number one. Uh, it came out, did OK, did some lectures, sold all our copies. Uh, I got a movie gig with Diane Keaton. I was very lucky to sit on Diane's couch with her alone in her apartment and swap copies of sucks. That was super cool. You know, I was yeah. really excited. And she looked at me and she said, how old are you? I said, 25. She said, oh, you're a genius, huh? <laughs> <laughs> like, you wrote a book, you're 25, it got published. <laughs> so, so it led to some really nice things, but writing wasn't sort of a uh, on the table for me to spend time on. Cause as we all know, writing is laborious. You, you write the same sentence 20 times, you, you black out and then you don't know if it's any good till somebody reads it 20 years later. So there's not a lot of reward coming to you right away. Unlike being a performer, you make something disappear. Ooh, ah. <laughs> so when you're not working, which for me was time, uh, as a performer, that is, I was writing because I was really interested in the history of magic. And a lot of the stuff that I read that I could get my hands on, I didn't believe was true. I thought it was all fiction. And so I started digging around in archives and and first with the bullet catch. And then in 1977, I just gotten a little clipping out of the newspaper. It said magician was consultant to the CIA. I thought, wow, this came out in the New York Times. Some guy died in this. What a story. I started researching it. That was 77 when I started. The book was published and done in 2008. Wow. 30, 31 years later. Wow. Wow. So, you know, risk and reward. But <laughs> I found after 12 Have Died came out that the magic community was hungry for good writing. And I am a good writer. Right. You know, it's I'm not a brilliant writer, but yeah. but I can put a sentence together and I can make it declarative and I can get to the heart of it right away with yeah. using a fancy French word, a little elan, yeah. meaning a little a little style. Right. And um, so John Booth was my editor on Twelve of Died along with Eddie Dawes. And John is a well, you know, he's a yeah. very amazing figure in our yeah. profession magician, writer, mountaineer, yeah. priest, all of it. And John said, Ben, and this was about 1990 now, he said, Ben, you really ought to pursue this because, you know, magic gigs come and go, but you write something, you can lecture on this book for the rest of your life. And, and he was right. And so I've now done 11 different publications. I won't call them all books, but I don't know. Dave, I have a hard time with the word book today, especially in our 
multimedia world because you know is something 64 pages a book right i guess so yeah it when we were growing up it was a booklet yeah (laughs) but 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 i think the thing that distinguishes it and and the jury's still out on this is i think it it's it's how good the material is and so um my little book on wonder uh Three or four years ago, the Museum of the Moving Image hired me to uh, do a show with their consultant producer, Joanne Hanley, called Magicians on Screen. Totally awesome show. Totally awesome show. For about six weeks, we showed all sorts of movies, cartoons, internet little snippets, and all sorts of things about magicians. They showed The Prestige. They showed George Melier. And the director of the museum is a fellow named Michael Schwartz. Uh, David Schwartz, excuse me, David Schwartz. And he and I were talking. I was basically selling my services to him as a consultant because he didn't know who I was. And he had met some more famous people and said, well, why don't we hire the famous people? And I said, because they're famous for being famous. And I actually know what I'm talking about. And I convinced him of that. And I said, did you know that all the silent clowns, the big four, Chaplin, Keaton, Lloyd, and Harpo Marx, they all used magic. And he said, what? I said, oh, yeah, they were all classically trained. Harpo Marx's grandfather was a full-time magician traveling in, in Germany. He said, I want that. I want that as a lecture. Can you do a book to... And, and he, he gave me the idea. So the ones I'm proud of are Magic and the Silent Clowns, which is an ebook available from library.com. Sorry, commercial. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> well, Dave, come on. No, we gotta no, you got to push your stuff, man. Yeah. And um, and then The Magician about John Montfell who died. A little book about wonder. And, and I got a new one coming out in April. This will be the first public announcement. Are you ready, David? I'm ready. Dun, I'm dun, 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 dun. <laughs> uh, The book is called Artful Mindfulness. And then it's subtitled Underlying Secrets of Artists and their art. So, yeah, and it's really exciting because have you ever studied something and you didn't know what you were studying? For instance, have you ever gone to a museum and said, and, and you know, you're just wandering around trying to pick up girls and, right. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> cause that's what magicians do that. folks. <laughs> that's what we do. We hunt in <laughs> museums, but anyway, and, and you see some art and you go, wow, that really speaks to me, but you don't know what school of art or what period or something. And then it, and then you dig it and then you look for more of it. You go, oh, that's modernism. Oh, I really dig that. Wow. And then you come across more and you go, oh, that's modern. And you recognize it. And then all of a sudden it's a few years later and you know about modernism. Well, the same thing happened to me, but with mindfulness. And I didn't even know what mindfulness was or that I was studying it. It only came to the fore. I was in Italy last June. Um, I had a gig talking about the the space between gigs in our lives, a woman hired me 25 years ago for her 25th birthday party in Somerset, New Jersey. So I go, I do the gig, everything's fine. I leave. I get a call last November or November 14. Hey, do you remember me? My name's Susanna and um, I'm having a party in Italy and it's my 50th birthday party and you did my 20th. (laughs) <laughs> can you be there? I was like, well, sure, if you pay me enough. And so we did. Well, I'm in a villa. It was a absolutely beautiful party. It, it went on for a week. The, you know, it was a, 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 not, a not poor event. And, um, and I shared this villa with a Swedish psychologist whose name I unfortunately don't remember. But she asked me to teach her some magic. And I said, why? Why does the shrink want to need, know some magic? And she said, oh, because I teach course in mindfulness in universities and private groups. I said, what is mindfulness? She said, well, as our world becomes more technologically oriented, that people don't have conversations, they all stare at their smartphones. I saw this just yesterday in a restaurant, you know, four people sitting there, no one's talking. They're all just tapping into their, their cell phones, smartphones. She said that we have to be reminded to think to feel. And all of a sudden I had the word for what I had been studying, which was these kind of, it's, it's almost hard to describe, but it's why things happen. Why did, 
why did uh, George Roy Hill hire Jeff Corey to play the sheriff in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid? No one knows who Jeff Corey is anymore, but... You know, Dave, when I just said the sheriff in Butch Cassidy, you had a picture of him in exactly. your mind, didn't you? Yeah. 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 You may remember his voice. He goes, what you doing coming in here? I got, I'm got, too old to hustle up another job. Would at least have the decency to draw your guns. Remember him? <laughs> yeah, I remember okay. that. Yeah. Jeff Corey. Well, I'm a huge fan, as my Facebook peeps know, that, you know, I dress from the 1880s. I just dig the style. I'm wearing a vest now. <laughs> And it all came from when I was five, six years old, watching the Wild Wild West yep. on TV with Robert Conrad, Ross Martin. Great show. Awesome show. Yeah, just an awesome show. And I saw Jeff Corey on the show in a, in a rerun, in a you know, DVD, and all of a sudden it hit me. My gosh. This was broadcast, I found out, the, the airing date, January 29th, 1969, uh, 68. Butch Cassidy started shooting September 7, September 16th, 1968. Jeff Corey had played almost exactly the same character on the Wild Wild West as he did or was going to in Butch. And so, you know, if somebody wants you for their festival, you say, hey, man, I've been New Orleans. I've been in every big city in this country. I can gather a crowd, hold the crowd, pitch your product, you can slap your your product across the front of my stage. I'll hold them. I'm your man. I've got the goods. Let's rock. Right. Jeff Corey did the exact same thing. He said, oh, Mr. Roy Hill. Well, yeah, here's a tape of me on a TV show six months ago doing exactly what you want. So why things happen? And I mentioned why Dick Bass brought me to Everest. Well, it's because I could handle anything as a street performer. So mindfulness is about why things happen and kind of having the precursor. But it's not just a resume credit. It's really, really beautifully listening. There's a story in the book, which, again, is, is short and sweet. People don't, unfortunately, read a lot these days, especially people under 30. Sorry to damn you all, but you need to read. Um, <laughs> damn it, read! I, you know, you write these short books, maybe they'll have a chance. And there's a story in the book about Charlie Chaplin. Now, you know, you can attack Chaplin any way you want or attach him. My point being is that you could say he was a filmmaker. He was a director. He was a composer. He was a dancer. He was, he was, this man could do anything, much less at the dawn of film. Well, it's 1952 and the Red Scare is screwing up the United States, if not the world. And for whatever reason, the Congress and Senator McCarthy have it in their heads that Charlie Chaplin was a communist. And because he was so popular, he might let those dread commies, you know, get our kids. And they were persecuting him for no good reason at all. It was, you know, absolutely. Uh, he had Chaplin had said that we need a second front in World War II. And then he praised Russia because they're the ones on the line starving and fighting. What's wrong with that? But McCarthy had really gone after him as a communist. Well, Chaplin said enough of this. And he had recently been married and he was going to leave the country. But just before he left the country, literally leaving his house and on the way to the train to New York City, where he'd catch the Queen Mary to England, he stopped off at the bank and he made his wife a co-signee of all his accounts, which were probably in the tens of millions of dollars. If Chaplin hadn't had that inspiration, which he writes in his autobiography, he says, I don't know why I did this. There was, my lawyer didn't advise me, no one said it, because at that time he was simply going on holiday. But if he hadn't done it, he would have lost all his money because the United States would have impounded it. And he had this inspiration. He went to the bank. His wife, Una, became the, as proprietor of that money as much as he was, rightfully. He was then censured. His, his return visa was canceled illegally. But Una, being a United States citizen, could come back to the United States and could attach that money and then bring it legally to Switzerland. That one thought saved his life and his family's life 
for the next 25 years and, you know, today. I mean, two months from now, the Chaplin Museum will open in Switzerland at their house. So, so this is mindfulness. This is, I mean, Dave, I'd like to hear about your experience. I mean, there must have been a time because street performers must be mindful. You can't, you can't phone it in. Yeah. You can either do it or you can't do it. And what you learn to do when you do it better as you've done is uh, to really listen to that little inner voice. Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, for me, what, what the, was sort of one of those situations and it's funny too because if I look back over my life, I have a newspaper. I grew up in a very small town, you know, from when I was born until I was about eleven, and it's mm -hmm. a town of about ten thousand people. And if I look back, we have newspaper clippings uh, from the local paper where I was up on stage in a drama, you know, uh, capacity uh, or in a Christmas concert. I was the lead singer on stage doing a solo, or I was. Uh, my father was the principal of the junior high uh, for uh -huh. a part of that period, so it, I'm in the I'm dribbling a, a basketball the size of myself across the you know this thing <laughs> and all these kind of interesting uh, performer esque moments, you know. And I think uh, I've always been a performer of some of of some kind, you know. Yeah. I've had varied jobs throughout the years, but there was almost that performance aspect sort of lingering in the background. And I think when I finally came to grips sort of with that idea was because I've sort of always been a poor employee, uh, you know, <laughs> so it was time to sort of lash out uh, on your own. And I wanted to, I had the, the world was calling, I would say, the, you know, the call to adventure. And you knew it. Yeah, you just knew it. I was sitting at a cabin a friend had rented out in the wilderness, you know, uh, casting my gaze across the uh, sort of... Uh, water and within in the pure silence and i remember thinking to myself like uh i'm done with this chapter you know i need to i need to go and i didn't at the time i didn't know it was going to be a, a street magic and entrepreneurship and getting into uh copywriting and stuff that I've, I've gotten into since but uh i knew it was time to close the book on uh on that part of the of my life and move on right many people don't listen to that because of other pressures uh, my wife was a professional dancer, but under the sword of Damocles of her parents who said, we won't pay for dance school unless you keep a straight A average. Right. So it didn't deplete her passion for dance, but it, it corrupted the passion because she couldn't do it unless something else happened. Now, she's now a very successful executive with Harmon International, and she does a, a bang-up job keeping hundreds of lawyers in line, which, you know, I don't know how anybody does that, but right. that's what she does. <laughs> and, um, but, but, there, I met a guy in December, and he hired me at the Mount Kisco Race way theater or something, whatever it was. I can't even remember. That's how old I am. I can't remember what I did two months ago. But anyway, uh, and he came up to me and he said, you, you followed your passion. When did you start doing this? I said, well, I got the bug when I was seven. I went pro when I was 14, meaning I started getting paid for it. But I really didn't make my living until I quit the first job I ever had and just said, screw it. I'm, you know, I'm going to be a magician. It's, it's either that or I'll die. I don't care. And he said, you know, I never had the balls to do that. I always wanted to do a high altitude trekking. I always wanted to paint. I always wanted to study literature, but my dad wanted me to be an accountant and I've been an accountant for 40 years now. And I said, well, you've provided for your family and you have three lovely children. And he said, yeah, and I have a beautiful house and we take a great vacation every year. And I said, yeah, so there's nothing lost. And he said, bullshit. I lost my passion. Right. So uh, to those who are listening, I really have to say it's, you know, good double negative coming up. It's not impossible. It is possible to follow your passion. You just have to treat it like a job. I mean, I don't hang out and drink tequila till four o'clock in the morning anymore, but, <laughs> but, uh, but that's part of it because you, as you get older and if you want to live in comfort, 
you got to go out there and make money. I tell friends of mine who are performers bitching about their lives, oh, I don't have any money. I don't have a job. I say, oh, yeah? How many phone calls did you make before noon today? They say, well, you know, I woke up at 1230. I say, well, get up at 830 and be on the phone by nine. Make your 20 phone calls and then you can be a slob. But you can't bitch about not having any work if you don't try and try means doing this. I'll tell you a, a, another another fun story, but it's a this it's not what does we say follow your passion, but the word that where people get hung up don't know what passion is, but they don't know what follow means. Right. Here's what follow means to me. There was a a guy, an agent named Stuart White, who is uh had an agency and a an office in the basement of the Hilton Hotel in New York City. So some article got written about him in the New York Times, and the, the thrust of the article, the hook, was that whenever somebody canceled, Stuart White was there with the fill-in, the celebrity. Like, he's the man to call if you're in trouble. So I figured, okay, the, the Hilton Hotel's not far from me. And because he was in the Times, of course, everybody was calling him, and no one could get through, and he's busy, busy, busy. So I dressed myself as my own messenger in coveralls that I borrowed from a janitor friend of mine. Underneath the coveralls, I was wearing a white silk suit, and, and, and I called his office to say I was delivering a package of money. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so they're like, well, who's the guy coming over with money? Well, yeah, we better see him. And when I got there, he was sitting there with this large knuckle breaking guy who he said was from the mafia. And he said, kid, this better be on the line because this guy will break your legs. And I said, well, gee, Mr. White, you know, uh, Mr. Robinson, he's a pretty serious guy and he wanted to send you over all this money. And he's like, what? And in the envelope, when he opened it, it's, it there was a large uh, marker piece of paper that said, I'm Ben Robinson. I need two minutes of your time. And when he looked down to open that envelope, I hit the button on the coveralls and they all fell to the ground. He looked at the note and then he looked back at me and all of a sudden I wasn't the poor speaking guy in overalls, but I was the charming guy in the white silk suit that somehow got into his office. Nice. And he said, kid, you impressed me. Now get the fuck out of here or I'll have you killed. <laughs> so I went, I left the, and then he said, okay, I'll get you a date. You know, like I'll, if you, if you're going to work that hard to get my attention, okay, you're on. That's what following means. I mean, people have to work for it. And I learned this phrase in Italy last summer, which really, really struck me. Um, they were, there was a wait staff. I mean, this party that I was at had, had a, a fluctuating cast of characters. But at one point, there were 120 people staying in five villas. And that's a lot of food. That's a lot of beds. You know, you have to be taken care of. And the, the head poobah, the guy who was running the joint, said to, to me after my show, he said, you know, I loved what you did. And I've seen magicians in Vegas and New York. And he said, but you really deliver. And I, I said, oh, thank you. He said, unlike my staff. And I thought, what? And then he said in Italian, which I can't say, but the, the phrase was entitlement without accomplishment. There's a, there's a sound bite. Yeah. And it really pushed my hair back because what technology has done is you can talk to anyone anywhere in the world without paying a hell of a lot of money. Because technology is there and it's free and it's this and it's that. Entitlement without accomplishment. And I thought, as you and I so well know as magicians, you know, it might take you a year, two years, five years in some senses to learn to do a piece of sleight of hand well and not just technically be able to do it, but to do it so it's invisible to an audience and still be entertaining. Right. Right. And kids today, I'm sorry to sound like an old man, but... I'm only 55, but, but kids today don't want to put in that effort, period. And those who do are going to succeed, and those who don't, unless they've got a lot of cash, are going to be left behind when the shit hits the fan. And, and on 9-11, I was in New York City. It was a mess. We were downtown. I won't get into the whole story, but we did need food, and I went to the 
grocery store it was you know a chain and people were going mad because all the electricity was out and the cash registers didn't work and I said to the manager you are about three minutes away from a full-out riot in here so let me stand on your counter talk to everybody do some magic for them calm them the fuck down and then let's get a piece of paper going as to who's taking what and we'll all be on the honor system and the guy said do your two minutes, take whatever you want, and get out of here. That kind of chutzpah is what you learn when you dig in and you read a magic book, you look at ink on a page, you pick up the deck of cards and say, now what is he telling me to do? Right. And then it's three years later, and not only have you learned to do it, but some woman comes up to you and gives you your number because of what you just did. And that's the kind of work that really, I hope, doesn't get lost. I work, as you know, with uh, Paul Romhaney and Vanish Magazine. And one, one of the reasons why Vanish is, became so successful is because both Paul and I work hard. He does a, a brilliant magic act as a chaplain-esque character doing magic. It's all, it's like a dream. It's very surreal. It's beautiful. And um, and he said, you know, we're both a little tired, we won't mention names, but of people who have become famous for becoming famous. You know, the art of magic is an art, but it's certainly not being practiced as an art by the people on TV. And why? Because they're busy selling soap suds and, you know, Kmart. And so that's my high horse. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, that's beautiful, and I think that is uh, what needs to be said. Uh, many instances, of course, I'm sure you encountered this somewhat as, as a street performer yourself, and I know myself and my friends do. Uh, you get other magicians or people who call themselves magicians. Uh, I just saw this the other day happen to a friend of mine actually here in New Orleans where someone comes up and after the show, and usually it's a younger person who has this entitlement without accomplishment, uh, where they said, oh, uh, can I borrow your deck of cards? I want to... Uh, show you a trick. And uh, my friend, uh, Warpo, uh, he said, uh, oh, well, just tell me where you're working at and I'll come see your show when I'm when I'm done working. You know, and uh, the kid was kind of taken aback, you know, and uh, he's he's like, yeah, because I'm working here. This is this is what I do, you know, and uh, we don't have time for this kind of nonsense. And, and we've seen tricks. So, I mean, we're, we're professional magicians, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's, I'm, I'm so glad you dig the phrase entitlement without accomplishment because it, it, the lines have become so blurred. Um, I, I did a show on a rooftop for a woman who, who had seen me a long ago and then all of a sudden her kid was of an age she felt would be able to dig my show. And so I go up there and, and the, the job was 30 minutes of close-up magic and then a little 10-minute break and then a, a stage show, which there's no stage. It's just, you know, a platform show, like, you know, for everybody all at once. I would say there are probably 50 people watching the stage show. Every single kid had a smartphone in their hand, was watching it through the smartphone recording me. And at one point, my wife said, Ben, you shouldn't have said that. You know, you're there to please them. But I finally just stopped the show and I said, why don't you people watch it like humans? Eyes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, your mind is the best recording device you'll ever have. But you're dependent on this thing. Now, who's out of touch? I'm out of touch. I'm the one who's wrong there. I, I admit it. I get it. But but it's a sad thing because they go home and now the performance exists on this little piece of plastic in, what, four inches by two inches? And it didn't. The performance was big. And, you know, I, I fill the stage and I'm, I'm, you know, changing water into ice in my hands. And on a little TV pocket screen, it kind of loses it. And I just think that that is terribly tragic, but I don't know what to do about it. Um, I, I, Dave, we, we can't do this broadcast without mentioning our, our dear friend, Paul Daniels. And 
Yes. How terribly sick he is right now. So we send our love to Paul. But the reason I bring Paul's name up in this context is I flew to Vegas in 2005 just to see Paul work. So any of you people out there who want to see a real pro work, you zap up Paul Daniels on YouTube because unfortunately, I, I don't think Paul's going to be standing on a stage too much longer. Yeah. It's and really um, it's really sad, too, Ben, because we just lost another absolute Tom legendary performer. Yeah, Tom oh. Mullica. And I was very lucky, very privileged uh, to work at the Abbott's Get Together convention uh, this past wow. year, where I uh, got to meet and talk with uh, Tom uh, for a little while. And he uh, was just as hilarious in a normal conversation as he was uh, performing and just a warm and generous guy. And it's a real shame that. Uh, you know, all you just never know. So if your people are out there, follow your follow as Ben says, follow by doing the work, and follow your passion and get started yesterday. Yeah, exactly. And what I was going to say about Paul real quick is, so it's 2005, and and you know, in Vegas lounges and Broadway shows, they all say recording of this performance is absolutely prohibited, and then they mention some legalese or something. Well, the show begins. Paul walks out. And there's a guy sitting in the front row. I mean, he, he, he could have put his hand on the stage. And he's got this big honking video camera staring right up at Paul. And Paul looks at him and he says, what do you think you're doing? And the guy doesn't answer. And Paul says, look, you got to put the camera down. Now, guy keeps shooting him. And, and finally, the guy says, it's our anniversary. And Paul says, well, then give me the camera. And he <laughs> yanks out of the guy's and he starts videotaping him. And, and, he, and he says, you can ask for this after the show. In fact, I'll sign it to you. And he turned what was an, starting out to be an ugly incident into a hilarious 10 minutes. That's awesome. And that's what A, being a performer is all about, listening to your audience, dealing with what is... And also, uh, keeping the lines clear, folks, when we do our show, you're paying to watch it. You're not paying to own it or to keep it. Unfortunately, because of the smartphones and the rest of it, Dave, you're out there doing a show. You oh, know, yeah. they say, oh, it's for your good because we're going to put this up on YouTube. Well, let's be <laughs> frank, whether it's you or me, what happens if you suck that night? <laughs> right. And then they put that tape up on the air. Yeah. <laughs> now, now it's a real problem because your most recent performance is your calling card, and it was one where it yeah, didn't go, didn't go so well. Yeah, yeah, and and it happens to everybody. I don't care who they are. I've heard I've heard so so. My point is, we're dealing in a world uh, that is even more challenging to the real performer. Not this crap you see on TV, but the people out there really doing like you and me. And we have to adapt. But here's where I don't think you should adapt or I should adapt or somebody listening to this should adapt. I don't think we give up our morals or our dignity or our hard work and phone it in. I don't think you do something easy because, well, OK, that's what it is. You follow your passion. You say, I'm going to build this sculpture. I'm going to write this novel. I'm going to do this street show. And that's it. Done. The form does not create the content. That's great. Uh, so, Ben, uh, let's maybe wrap it up a bit. And yeah. let's, let's uh, how do people hire you? How do people get in touch with you and, and hire you for, for gigs and uh, get you working? All right. It's very simple. You go to my website illusiongenius.com very humble <laughs> and uh there's a little box on there that says contact fill it out send me an email that will uh ultimately get to me and if it's a corporate job uh it'll go to you know somebody who handles corporate for me if it's a private gig i'll talk to you if it's something i want to do um if it's tv you can talk to my very very hard nosed agent at the Don Buckwald Agency. And uh, and that's it. You know, I'm a person. Doc Eason always says, hey, I answer my own telephone. Well, I never answer my telephone. <laughs> <laughs> I will not talk to just anybody. But I am hireable. And I, I thank you, David, for allowing me to be on here. It, it's a gas. And I can't wait to meet you. 
Yeah, and uh, if they want to get your books, uh, read your books. Go to Amazon.com. Okay. Go to my website, uh, IllusionGenius.com. There are the links there. Um, the, the one that you all really want to read is The Magician, John Mulholland's Secret Life, the story of the magician who consulted the CIA. Um, if you're a magician and you want a primer to what John Booth did with his life for writing, there's a book called The John Booth Reader, which not a lot of people know about, but for a pittance, you can have a, it's an outline to all his books that John and I did. It'll tell you a lot of good stuff. Magic and the Silent Clowns is there, and the Wonder Book is on Amazon. Uh, yeah, just uh, so the importance of Wonder is on Amazon. Yes, it is. Awesome. Well, it's been a great pleasure having you on the show, Ben. Uh, you're a great uh, storyteller, and a, I'm sure Thank a fantastic you. performer. And I've seen some of your clips. I I do hope to meet you in the near future and uh, commiserate over our street uh, street days <laughs> you betcha you betcha that there's nothing more fun than, than uh doing that i really look forward to it david thank you so much well thanks a lot ben and we'll talk soon okay ciao uh, yes ciao and for everybody out here uh we'll be back uh, carlos will be back on the next show and we will also uh, like to thank ben sound at bensound.com for the intro and outro music for the takeover tuesday podcast we will see you all next tuesday I'm <laughs> sorry.